One of the most important facets of gaming that is unfortunately coming to a conventional end would have to be dedicated handheld gaming. It's been something that I have been around for the entire life cycle of it, and there's not many things I can say when it comes to video games that I've been around for the entire thing for, but dedicated handheld gaming is something I have been around since day one. Now, of course, a lot of this is being spurred on by the fact that PlayStation has announced there will be no PlayStation Vita successor. Of course, when you look at what Nintendo is doing with the Nintendo Switch, it is both a console and a handheld system. Sure, the Nintendo Switch Lite is technically a dedicated handheld, but really it will probably be the final dedicated handheld from Nintendo as that market just seems to be dwindling a bit. So today I just want to talk about the rise and fall of dedicated handheld gaming. Talk about my memories of it, what I remember from the heyday of it, and why we ended up getting into this situation. But I also want to talk about the future of handheld gaming because I think there still is a future of it, but it's probably not the conventional way that many of us think of. So as far as handheld gaming is concern. Of course, a lot of it started with Nintendo introducing the Game & Watch, but the real first blow in the handheld gaming market had to be the Nintendo Game Boy, which was the first dedicated handheld system that used cartridges, had its own library of games, and I remember when I first got my Nintendo Game Boy. I got a good report card, and my mom took me to KB Toys and let me pick up a Nintendo Game Boy with Super Mario Land 2, the six golden coins. Now, this game was absolutely fascinating to me. It was different than a lot of other Mario games at that time had the top-down map style that we saw in Super Mario World, but I was just absolutely enthralled with this game. I loved the levels that the game had. I loved the creativity within the levels. The soundtrack of it was really good. Of course, Wario was introduced in this game, and I definitely played this game hundreds of times over, beat it many different times, and I always really enjoyed it. I always thought it was a very unique Mario game, and while it was a bit on the easy side, it was definitely a very fun Mario game. Now, I didn't have the biggest Game Boy library in the world. I did have Link's Awakening, which I absolutely absolutely love, but most of my other games consisted of games like Alleyway and F1 Racing, which were like cheaper Game Boy games that my mom didn't mind picking up for me. But back in those days, you loved whatever game you had. Alleyway was, you know, a breakout clone, but it was still fun. There was little Mario references. F1 Race was basically a racing game. It wasn't anything super special, but I definitely had a lot of fun with it. Definitely one of my fondest memories, though, was with Mortal Kombat 2 on the Game Boy. Yes, Mortal Kombat came out on the Game Boy, and Mortal Kombat 2 really wasn't a terrible port, but I used to bring my Game Boy to church with me and sit there and play Mortal Kombat 2 in church. And it always felt very sacrilegious, you know, like I'm probably going to hell for playing Mortal Kombat in church, but it was always so much fun. Of course, all the other kids would crowd around me because why is this kid playing Mortal Kombat in church? Definitely very, very fond memories. But as the success of the Game Boy started to spurn on, other companies wanted to get involved. Of course, Atari got into the mix with the Atari Lynx. I never owned an Atari Lynx. I have emulated some of the games on there. Kind of a unique system, but it didn't really have that strong of a library of games. The real first competitor to the Nintendo Game Boy was, of course, the Game Gear. And being a Sega fan, I had to have a Game Gear. It had Sonic the Hedgehog on it, and I loved Sonic the Hedgehog. So I remember getting my Game Gear for a birthday. We were in the mountains of North Carolina. We had rented a cabin for my birthday because I, I don't really know why. There was no AC in there. It was hot as balls. Like, I'll never forget that cabin trip. But I ended up getting a Game Gear and I was so excited, but then I realized we, we need batteries for this. I got to get some batteries. So there was only one small country store at the bottom of a hill, and we went down to the bottom of the hill. We got the batteries for it. They were ever-ready batteries that had this stupid little cat on them, and 30 minutes later, they died, and my parents weren't going to buy me any more batteries, and that was pretty much it for the game gear for that trip. But of course, I ended up getting an AC adapter and a lot of fond memories with that system. I really enjoyed the game gear. It definitely was a cool system because of the fact that it had color. It had a front lit screen, it had a really solid library of games, but it really couldn't replace the Game Boy in my opinion because of the functionality of the Game Boy. The Game Boy batteries will last you quite a while, the Game Gear not so much, but Sega definitely made an impact. And of course you had other companies come along when handheld gaming started to become a success. You had companies like Tiger release the Tiger handhelds, and I think every kid in the 80s and 90s had at least one Tiger handheld. They were cheap, they were crappy, they weren't really good at gaming experiences, but they got a lot of the main IPs. Of course, Tiger actually tried to get into the handheld market with the R-Zone, which 
Yeah, that, that, that was a terrible idea. Let's take the Virtual Boy concept, which doesn't work and it's not really a handheld, and make it just over one of your eyeballs. It actually made an appearance on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air though, so they were trying with that system. But essentially, it was just Tiger handheld games in sort of red and black and little 3D aesthetics. I don't know, it just did not work very well. Many competitors came and many competitors didn't really make a mark. You had Neo Geo get into the handheld market. You had the Wonder Swan handheld, and they were cool little systems, but definitely niche systems. Systems. Of course, Nintendo introduced more Game Boys. There was Color Game Boys. There was the Game Boy Color. But really when the Game Boy Advance hit the market is when you saw a big gap start to happen in the handheld market. The Game Boy Advance was a very powerful system and it was capable of doing things that many people didn't think handheld gaming would be able to do. It had mainline Nintendo IPs. It had brand new IPs as well, such as Golden Sun, that were big successes on the Game Boy Advance. Of course, you were able to replicate better graphics. You were able to have multiplayer via Link cables and things like that. I remember every day during second period in high school, we would skip second period and we would go to Arby's because Arby's is dank, man. I, I that freshly sliced roast beef, man. Uh, you can't beat an Arby's roast beef sandwich. That is high quality fast food. But Arby's was our little hangout spot and we would bring our Game Boys. Like the whole staff knew us because they would open at like 11 o'clock and that's when we would get there. So we'd already be getting our orders ready and we would just sit there and play Game Boy Advance games for like an hour and a half and eat delicious Arby's food and get free refills on the drinks and it was just so much fun playing things like Mario Kart or the Super or the Mario Brothers uh, retro style game that was on the Game Boy Advance just so much fun playing that such a great library but I really didn't play many of the heavy hitters in the Game Boy Advance library I would say I got back into handheld gaming heavily during the real revolution of handheld gaming with the Nintendo DS and of course the PSP because these two systems were very dynamically different but I feel like they both catered to a market and and they both had a place on the market. The Nintendo DS was a very unique experience. You had a touch screen. You had two screens on this system as well. Very, very unique. The PSP was definitely a very powerful system. You were able to get almost PlayStation 2 quality graphics, which was a prominent home console at that time, available in the palm of your hand. I remember playing games like Tony Hawk and Midnight Club and Grand Theft Auto on the PSP and just being absolutely blown away. It was such a fantastic system. But Nintendo's with their uniqueness, on the Nintendo DS and a strong library of games definitely reeled me back in. I owned both a Nintendo DS and a PSP, but I definitely favored my Nintendo DS because I love the touchscreen on it. It really opened up doors to new gameplay experiences. Games like Metroid Prime Hunters, a first person shooter in which you control it with the touchscreen. It sounds kind of cumbersome, but once you got used to it, it was a hell of a lot of fun. It had a very solid online as well. And the Nintendo DS and the PSP were very, very successful systems. Some of the most successful handhelds of all time. But then unfortunately, we started to get this thing called mobile gaming. Smartphones started to become a big thing. And because of this, now companies were able to put their games on smartphones, which everyone pretty much had. You saw things like Candy Crush Saga come along and everyone became addicted to it. And it's like, why? Like, why are you addicted to this? This isn't a Mario game. This isn't a Grand Theft Auto game. But mobile gaming sort of became this simplified thing. And when with the Nintendo 3DS and the PS Vita came out, you definitely saw a decline in dedicated handhelds because of the rise of mobile gaming. These cheap free-to-play experiences or free-to-start experiences started trumping what the dedicated handheld market was doing. I remember getting my 3DS on launch night. Me and my buddy went to a Walmart. We were super excited and we were the only two people there waiting for the Nintendo 3DS. And I love the Nintendo 3DS. I think the PS Vita is a quality system as well. The Vita was able to do very capable and high-quality graphics on there. Look at games like Uncharted on the PS Vita. Absolutely amazing stuff. But that market started to definitely dwindle. And the 3DS did end up seeing strong sales, but the Vita definitely wasn't as strong as the PSP. And that really was the writing on the wall for dedicated handheld gaming devices. That is why we're not seeing a successor to the PS Vita anymore, because PlayStation and Sony just don't see the value in it anymore. Look at what Nintendo is doing with the Nintendo Switch. It is a hybrid console. It is a home console and a portable console. Now, yes, the Nintendo Switch Lite just came out, and of course, it's seeing success, but really at its core, it's still a home console system. You're able to play home console games on the go. It's not a dedicated handheld in which you cannot play these games on your television screen without sort of emulating something or having some sort of device that allows you to do that, like we saw with the Game Boy Player on the GameCube. But I definitely don't think handheld gaming is necessarily dead. I think the traditional way of handheld gaming will die very, very soon, but you're starting to see things happen with things like xCloud and Google Stadia. More 
more so xCloud because Google Stadia is getting off to a bit of a rocky start, but these are allowing you to play your home console games and stream them onto your cell phone, onto your tablet, hook up a controller, and then bam, you're playing the same game you would play on your home console on your mobile device via things like the cloud. And I definitely think that that is the future of handheld gaming. That is where handheld gaming is going to move into. You're starting to see things like Nintendo getting involved in the handheld gaming market with games like Super Mario Run that are seeing great success. I think handheld gaming will probably end up shifting fully to mobile gaming very, very soon. You're not going to see things like dedicated handheld gaming devices coming to us from the three big companies, Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony. But you know what? I think that's okay. I don't think everything needs to last forever. I think we need to get out when the getting is good. And I think handheld gaming definitely made a huge impact on the gaming market. There's a reason why companies like Analog are making their upcoming Game Boy device because so many people have so many fond memories of handheld gaming. And I still think there's a demand for it, but it's definitely dwindled from the big companies to the smaller companies. Handheld gaming will still be around in forms of mobile devices and stuff like that. But the heyday of the dedicated handheld gaming device, well, that's pretty much setting on the sun but I think that's okay you know it's been fascinating like I said to see all of the handheld gaming that has happened in my lifetime I've seen the rise and now I've seen the fall of it and now looking towards the future I think it'll be an interesting future so let me know in the comments section down below some of your thoughts about handheld gaming and your memories about handheld gaming and as always guys thank you for checking out this video if you're new to the channel make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications check out other videos on the channel and as always I'll catch you guys on the next one later